Hello and welcome to the second video of uh, that new series on dominating the opponent species. So we're gonna have a look today at a game between the Danish Grandmaster Rasmussen against uh, Rerapson, who is a very strong American Grandmaster. He is uh, he has been playing uh, for the na for the for the US national team, which is quite an achievement. I think if if I'm not wrong, <laughs> I think he at some point out uh, the best score at the puzzle rush on uh, on chess.com. So that's also an impressive performance. So he's definitely somebody who knows how to play chess. Trust me, he, his rating is around twenty seven hundred, and he's really a great chess player. So the open he was black, and it was I mean the opening was a classical Catalan when he played bishop before check and c5 which is one variation amongst many bishop before knight e5 to collect the c4 pawn black just castles gives the pawn back and plays knight c6 and uh, well he has double pawns but he has uh, easy play he's gonna he's attacking d4 and after e3 is pushing e5 so we are having here a very concrete position obviously if white is able to stabilize the position, then it's going to be clearly better um, because of these double pawns and this, uh, well, this two versus one in the center. Um, but it's a very concrete position here. Black is in time to play e5. So there is no time to take the pawn because after queen d1, knight g4, black would recover the pawn with interest. So d5, b5, very nice move by Robson, so the knight cannot move anywhere if knight d2 and d5 will be hanging, so d6 has to be played. Queen d1, make sure you do not, you do take on d1 before taking on c4, because that would be a very bad surprise for black, with both rooks uh, being under attack. Queen d1, bc4, so now c7 trying to trap the rock first of all uh black could possibly well first of all black could give a check for example and if f3 just move um the bishop and then the rock is not hanging if not f3 then just rock c8 and i mean even if, if there was no check even some sacrifice like this and then rock c8 rock takes uh, c7 bishop here knight there that would be huge compensation so white should definitely keep this very strong pawn on c6, which is basically the only uh, only strength of the white position. White played a3, which is a very logical move, since uh, a5 is not possible because of a b4, and then the a pawn would be pinned. So at the last moment for white to play a4, a3, and force black to move the b4 pawn and earn the c3 square for the knight. Bishop g4 check, excellent move again by Ray Robson. In cases of f3, there would be bishop e6 simply, and if a b4, now knight e5. First of all, the diagonal of the bishop is now closed, uh, but also there is a double attack, which is quite painful, and c6 is going to be a huge weakness, not even mentioning the white king that is quite weak as well. So bishop g4 check, king c1 was played, Going to e1 looked pretty risky after some maybe rook d8 and some mating threats here. On d1, this is not really something you want. So king c1 looks much more natural. But here the total domination of the white pieces is starting with b3. And you can already see what pieces are going to be dominated. So b3, knight c3, rook c8. So... Rare Robson does not consider King D2, King E1 as a threat for now because it would be a little bit too slow. They would, Rook D1 would still not be threatened, so he's taking his time. And now that White would possibly like to get his King to E1 and then his Rook to C1, he plays Rook D8 so that uh, the White pieces remain paralyzed. F4, trying to seek for counterplay. E4, another very good move by black. In case, uh, so G4 was played in case of knight E4, then knight E5, and black would have problems to defend E3. C6 would also be hanging. That would be quite a disaster for white. 
g4, and now knight d5. Why knight d5? Because, well, black is ready to exchange any piece so that white only stays with this very passive rook on a1. So this re reminds a lot of the game MVL versus Ding Liren when Maxim was exchanging every piece so that Ding stays with that rook on h7 and that bishop on f8. If you remember that game that we just saw. And this is exactly what uh, black is doing here. White took on e4, so of course no exchange on c3 because then there would be a, a good square for the king on b2 and the rocks would be active again, so we take on e3. Takes, takes. Here you can see that white is paralyzed, so he can, he can he has to do something. He needs to play king d2 and free his, free his, uh, his pieces at some point, otherwise he's just lost. So he played c7, which looks like a clever move, because in case of rook c8, for example, then king d2 would be a great news for white, and in case of another move, then bishop b7 is gonna win a piece. But actually, Ray Robson does not care about sacrificing a piece, as long as this rook stays here, and this knight stays paralyzed to prevent a mate on d1. So he just played h6 here, and after, well, f5 was played, and then queen, and he just played this position, he's a piece down. Here white tried to trick black with bishop a6. What is the idea behind this move? He wants to play a4, a5 and rook a4. And then if he manages to free his rook, it, that could be simply winning for white. I mean, that could be an extra piece. So of course he could have started a4, but then black, I mean, this is making the trick too obvious. So then black would obviously play a5. And you can say goodbye to all your good dreams or of, of freeing your rook. Uh, so he started with bishop a6, but of course Ray Robson is too strong not to, to miss something like that. He played rook d6 and a5 himself, and there is no a4, a5 anymore for white. So white had to remain passive. Just uh, He just waited, basically. The black king came, and actually the black king came and so far that it even reached the e1 square which is normally the initial uh, square of the white king so it's a black king that ends up on e1 which is not something you see very often with so many pieces on the board f6 was played and black took and after rook d2 white just resigned despite being an extra piece in an endgame why did he resign? Because the, ma the mate is unavoidable, rook c2 is a threat, and in case of rook a1, then there would be check. And knight f1, knight f1, threatening knight d2. Knight e4, knight d2, check, takes, takes, and it's a very beautiful thing that the king and the rook uh, are just uh, enough to, so that the rook c1 mate is unavoidable. You can see that rook and a1 that is totally useless so that was a true masterpiece by by ray robson a very impressive game and i found particularly interesting that moment when he decided to sacrifice a piece uh, to allow bishop b7 and c8 queen just considering that losing a piece is nothing if he is actually playing with two extra pieces uh two extra pieces that are still on the board but that are, but that are actually total ghost and that are not uh and that do not have any any value actually it may be well ju just as i said in the mvl game you might you may even consider it as a counter value because for example here if if there was no rock on if there was no rock on b1 at least there would be no mating threat so actually it's even worse for white to have this uh this passive pieces that are and now there would be no ma no ma well there would be a mating threat without the rock there would be an id2 and rock c1 but you can see that actually white is trying Eris. I mean, white would like to have a little bit more freedom with his king, and his king, this freedom is uh, prevented uh, because of uh, why, because of his own pieces. So anyway, a very nice model game about uh, domination of the opponent's uh, pieces, uh, and that uh, that shows uh, that a trapped piece. Uh, a trapped piece uh, does not necessarily count as a piece. I mean that uh, it was definitely a great idea from Rare Robson to sa to sacrifice a piece and to sort of keep the white pieces uh, in a sort of uh, jail.
uh, on the queen side. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed the game and see you very soon for a third episode.